So Joe Grant, who we've mentioned before, uh, he was a story artist. And back in 1937, he had an English uh, Springer Spaniel called Lady. And so he wrote a short story about the different antics yeah, that uh, that lady got up to. And when he showed uh, Walt Disney this, bear in mind this is 1937, so they've just uh, released uh, Snow White. So Walt Disney reads the stories for this and he goes, actually, this would sound really good. However, it needs a little bit more work for it. So throughout the late 30s and the early 40s, uh, Joe Grant ends up working on the story for this. And he puts different uh, add-ins in and it still isn't enough yet. It still isn't what, what Disney wants. He still says, no, like there, there's something missing in this year. Like it's just, it's, it's, you know, there's not enough action. It's, you know, uh, the lady is just too nice. Like there's nothing really happening in this story yet. So there needs to be more conflict within this. So, in 1945, this is where Walt Disney ends up reading the Cosmopolitan uh, uh, magazine short story, which is Happy Dan and the Cynical Dog, right? Written by Ward Green. So, this is a real game changer because they go, right, what we need to do is we need to have Lady fall in love with this cynical dog here, right? So, this gives you the romance story, this gives you the conflict, this gives you everything that we need and stuff, right? So, now we can start working on the actual thing. So they bought the rights for the uh, story. Again, we don't know how much it is, um, but if it's anything to go off of, if we look at like Dumbo, if we look at like kind of uh, Bambi and all the other uh, uh, short stories that Disney bought in that time, they probably didn't get much money for it, right? Uh, you know, people uh, writing in those days didn't get a lot for their money. Um, so we, it probably wasn't that much. But either way, they bought the rights to it and they started working on the film. So some of the original names that they had for the Tramp in the beginning were Homer, you had Rags, you had Bozo, and eventually they settled on the name Tramp. In uh, 1940, they ended up adding in the Siamese uh, cats, right? Uh, this obviously gives a bit more tension, a bit more kind of conflict and stuff. Uh, also as well, uh, you had originally uh, just one uh, neighborhood friend, but this over time ended up being morphed into two. So this is where you end up getting Jock and Trusty. Uh, also as well, in some of the original scripts, uh, it was a thing where Aunt Sarah was a lot harsher of a character. So whereas in the actual like, kind of like film, she's just someone who just doesn't really like dogs and stuff, but overall is still a good person. In some of the earlier scripts, she was actually a horrible person, right? Uh, and really, really mistreated the dogs. And then also it's meant to note is that uh, Jim Deer and Darlin were originally going to be called Jim Brown and Elizabeth. But they decided that actually, you know, if you're having this uh, a thing made from lady perspective, from a dog perspective, you know, the dog is listening to, to the names of, oh, Jim, dear, oh, darling. Yeah, and all those things that, right? So that's why they decided to stick with those things. Yeah, so much like in Tom and Jerry. So it's very much from like the kind of perspective of, of, of the actual animal thing itself. And that's why that was done in that way. And that's also as well why you don't tend to see too much of their faces, yeah, because the focus is more on the animals, right? And then also as well, yeah, we have to add in the fact that uh, uh, the rat was originally going to be kind of a funny character. So if you think about Cinderella with the mice and stuff, it's quite a funny character. Well, rats are not the same as mice, but whatever. <laughs> but it's a thing where obviously uh, how it ended up uh, being in the, the uh, final cut is that the rat is a very menacing and scary character because obviously it's trying to eat the baby. And also as well, they had this really weird like love triangle, yeah. So the, the Russian wolfhound, yeah, which you see in the dog pound, that was actually going to be the basis of there being a love triangle, right? So there's going to be a love triangle between Lady, the Tramp, and uh, Boris, right? So, you know, I'm glad that they kind of cut that because it just was unnecessary. Like, it just, it would have fluffed the film far too much and just, just unnecessary to the story, really. It didn't need to really happen. And then also as well, in the opening sequence, yeah, where you have, uh, you know, Lady being unwrapped from a, from a, a hat box, that was actually inspired by Walt Disney himself because he ended up having a, a dinner date with his wife that he ended up having to miss. And so to make up for it, he bought a puppy and he had it in a hat box, right? So that same thing was influenced by Walt Disney himself. So now we've covered the story of the creator. Now it's time for us to dive into the story of the uh, studio, right? So Joe Grant, he ended up leaving the Disney studios in 1949, but Disney insisted that he write a short novella for uh, Lady and the Tramp in order to kind of like promote the, the, the thing, right? However, because uh, he, he did this, this is why Joe Grant doesn't appear in any of the credits for the film, right? Because he got the credits for the book that he wrote. So now talking about the casting for the film. So you had many different people within the cast for it. However, the most notable of all was Peggy Lee. 
So Peggy Lee was a very famous uh, jazz singer. So uh, if you know like the song uh, Big Spender, if you know Fever, many, many others, she obviously uh, was the singer for that. So over the course of her career, she sang many, many songs and she wrote many songs as well. And actually within this, she plays four different characters and she co-wrote six of the different songs. Most notably of all is He's a Tramp. So the dog in that who sings that is called Peg and that's obviously named after Peggy Lee herself. So that's her singing. So on top of playing the voice of Peg, she also plays the voice of Darling and also the voice of the two cats. So this is Sai and Am. Now talk about the person who did the voice for a uh, uh, lady. Uh, this is Barbara Luddy. So Barbara Luddy, uh, she did the voice of Kanga in the Winnie the Pooh series. Uh, she also did uh, Merryweather uh, in Sleeping Beauty. So one of the fairies. So we'll talk about that in the next video. Uh, for uh, for the tramp, uh, this is uh, voiced by uh, Larry Roberts. He's not really anything too significant. He's just like in in a, a few like uh, TV shows, and then also as well, yeah, right. You have uh, Bill Thompson, who we've mentioned in other videos. So he's uh, the voice of Smee. He's the voice of the White Rabbit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in this, he plays six different roles. He does Jock. He does Tony's assistant. He does uh, the Bulldog. He does Jim's friend. He does the Dash Hound. And it also does uh, the, the voice of the Irish policeman. So I don't know why like they couldn't just find a Scotch person to do his accent because where he's playing Jock, it's really obvious that he's not Scottish. But anyway, yeah, like it's kind of annoying. But yeah, anyway. But either way, he you know, he's a really good actor and stuff. And so it was good that he was in that. You also had Verna Felton, who we've mentioned in other videos as well. So she's the voice of the uh, fairy godmother in uh, Cinderella and also the Queen of Hearts in uh, Alice in Wonderland, right? So she is the voice of uh, Aunt Sarah. And actually, if you look at uh, Aunt Sarah within this, right, she is actually modelled off of uh, Verna Felton, right? It's very, very similar. And then finally, you had Alan Reed. So this is the voice of Boris the dog. And actually, he was the original voice of uh, Fred Flintstone, right? So just a little bit of trivia with regard to that. So this covers most of the casting for the film. And then talking about within the studio itself, so much just like uh, uh, how you had in Bambi, you had like animals being brought into the studio, yeah, to make more realistic models for it. Uh, so yeah, so obviously you had like, a bunch of dogs who were brought into the Disney studios for them doing the drawings and stuff. And also I found this really, really shocking. So the spaghetti and meatball scene, which is like really iconic. You think of Lady and Tramp, you know, you think of that scene. Disney himself almost cut that from the actual thing. And the reason for that is because he thought that it was going to be too silly and he thought it would not be romantic enough, right? However, Frank Thomas, who's an animator who we've mentioned in previous videos, he intervened and he overrid um, uh, Disney and he said, right, you need to animate this. So he got it animated. And also as well, they added in... Um, uh, it was like half seconds or something to basically slow down the actual animation. So if you actually look at the clip itself, how like the characters are moving on screen is at a much slower frame rate than it it, it would be for like the whole rest of the film and stuff. And this is kind of adds on to the romance. So after actually doing the scene and showing it to Disney, Disney was won over and he said, well, you know, well done, Frank and stuff. Yeah, right, we're gonna keep this in. So it's funny that one of the most iconic bits of the whole film almost got cut, yeah, because Walt Disney kind of interfered with it. Also as well, we should say that uh, Lady and the Tramp was the very first animated feature length film which was done by Cinemascope. So Cinemascope, this was uh, basically specialising in widescreen uh, 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 like framing and stuff. Um, and this was something which in particular in like the 50s and 60s was very, very popular. However, the problem with this when you, you, it's done for, uh, for animation is that while it does make it a lot more realistic looking, it makes uh, close-ups a lot more difficult to do and it also makes the action scenes a lot more difficult to animate, right? Um, because obviously, obviously everything's all stretched out. So it was a good innovation, but at the same time, it also uh, brought many challenges to it that they hadn't had to, to face before. And then finally, with regard to the story of the studio, I should say that like we said in the previous video with uh, Peter Pan, Peter Pan was the last feature length film which uh, Disney used RKO pictures for. Now, starting with Lady and the Tramp and moving forward, everything was done and owned by Walt Disney itself. So you had a Buena Vista uh, distribution, which would later become the Walt Disney Studio uh, motion pictures, right? So this trend began with uh, Lady and the Tramp, and ever since then, uh, Walt Disney has owned every single part of the making of uh, their films. So now we've kind of covered the story of the studio. Now we're going to talk about the themes in history. And the themes in history, 
there aren't any, right? Um, I suppose in terms of the history, you could kind of say it's a kind of quaint 1950s film, very stereotypical, very kind of suburban. Um, there's a kind of class divide, I suppose, but it's not a thing of criticizing class. It's more kind of just saying, oh, it's more just a kind of like uptown girl meets that uh, downtown boy kind of vibe, right? It's not, you know, it's kind of a love interest and stuff, but it's not really that interesting. There's not much conflict that kind of comes from that. It's just, it's just an interesting thing. It's a bit, you know. So you have that. And then also, I guess, one of the themes, I suppose, is, well, first of all, you have to like dogs, yeah, like that, like, to really love this film. Do you like dogs? Dogs. What? Yeah, dogs. Dogs. Do you like dogs? Oh, dogs. I think if you don't love dogs, it's it's a good film, but it's not like that great. Um, but it's yeah, if you love dogs, this is really really good. And also, you know, the film itself is dedicated to dogs all around the world and stuff, right? So it's kind of it's it's a film made for dogs and dog lovers, right? Well, obviously, just for dog lovers because dogs can't appreciate the film, whatever. Um, but I suppose the only kind of theme that is kind of recurring within it is that it's the thing of dogs are man's best friend, and yet man always thinks that dogs are stupid they, they don't really know what's going on they ignore the dogs uh, they, you know they mistreat the dogs etc etc when all the dog wants to do is be loyal and stuff and i suppose that's why joe grant uh, made it yeah because obviously like you know he wrote it at a time when his his uh, newborn baby was coming through and he kind of realized that his dog which he'd always kind of focused on before now is kind of being like kind of like pushed to the side and stuff right so I suppose that's kind of the only theme is like be nice to your dog or whatever so um so yeah so anyway that, that's kind of that um and then talking about the uh, legacy of the film the critics criticized the film when it first came out yeah because they said that it was too gooey they said that the animation was poor and also it just wasn't one of disney's best yeah right and i have to agree with that it's not a bad film but it's definitely not one of the best it's not very like visually stimulating at all and yes at certain parts it is quite gooey right um but that seems to not matter because the audience really loved it right mm -hmm. 